Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, we're going to talk about the seven universal principles as described by the author Connie Mendez. Recently, I discovered this amazing author and she has written several books and I just ate them up and I was excited to share them with you. Connie Mendez was born in Caracas, Venezuela in 1898. She's the daughter of distinguished author and poet Don Eugenio Mendez y Mendoza. She devoted many years of her life to the theater as producer, director, and actress in productions benefiting the International Red Cross Society. Her musical output consists of more than 40 compositions, the best known of which are in a folkloric vein and are still available in international record stores. Her classic and romantic works cover a wide range, including an oratorio in the sacred tradition, She's the author of numerous poems, as well as composer of all lyrics for her music, and has performed at many international concerts featuring her own music. In 1946, she founded the Christian Metaphysics Movement in Venezuela and began to dedicate herself completely to this esoteric teaching, bringing her writings and lectures to the major cities of Central and South America. The Venezuelan government has accorded her many high honors in recognition for her achievements. And today we're going to talk about the seven universal principles which can be found in her book, The Mystical Number Seven, which I most certainly will return to. We've been talking about laws and the universal laws in several episodes. We've dedicated it to the laws of correspondence, the law of non-resistance, the law of receiving, the law of substitution. And the reason I have made this a focus is that we're breaking down the programming of the matrix. If we can understand these principles and laws, then we can utilize these rules within the matrix to understand its programming, and we can thrive within the simulation understanding its rules and programming. Now a principle, which is what Connie Mendez is talking about, is very similar to a law. A principle is a prime and irrevocable law. Gravity is a function of mass in relation to distance. This is true from the easily observable facts that things fall to earth and that water seeks its own level to the fact that even light cannot escape the incredible gravitational pull of the collapsed stars called black holes. So when Connie Mendez is talking about principles, she's talking about laws. The seven universal principles. The seven principles are mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and regeneration. I recommend that you memorize this list in the order presented, bearing in mind that this breakdown of principle is a convenience and that these principles act as one. Perhaps the best way to understand this concept is to think of principle as a seven-sided jar. Each side is distinct, yet each is joined to the others, and without any one of them, the vessel would be incomplete, and it wouldn't hold water. Complete. It is a vessel of infinite capacity. In the process of these studies, you may feel the urge to refute, to argue. For now, I ask that you put aside such urges until you have completed the series. Hold your doubts in abeyance, or they will interfere with your grasp of the total concept. Once you have completed all of my books, bring out your arguments. If you have read carefully and applied the principle involved, you'll find those doubts have dissipated like mist in the morning sun. The Principle of Mentalism If you have read my first book in the series, Metaphysics for Everyone, you are already acquainted with the principle of mentalism as the most important principle of the principles of creation, as an introduction to the truth that lies behind all things visible and material. The truth is this. All is mind. All things are thoughts, and all thoughts are things. The most visible example is the development of a child. Tell him from birth that he is worthless, ugly, stupid, and inept, and you will create a cringing misfit of an adult, full of hate and terror. But tell the same child he is loved, he is valuable, intelligent, and capable, and you have created a successful, well-adjusted individual who is happy and loving. Those constantly repeated thoughts have become facts. What you can do with the impressionable 
raw material of a young child's mind, you can do with yourself, your associates, your surroundings, and you can do it with thoughts and words, all is mind. On the simplest level, a cheerful, pleasant attitude, even at times when you aren't really in the mood, will not only improve your own inner feelings, but will produce the same feelings in those around you as well, with the result that those happier faces around you will build your own sense of well-being even more, a most unvicious circle. The simple thought of happiness expressed in a smile is a very powerful tool. The principle of mentalism also tells us this remarkable positive force has its negative side. If you harbor self-doubts, resentments, ill will towards others, negative thoughts in general, these too will generate negative feedback from others. Positive or negative, your true beliefs will always be manifested. But do you really know what your true beliefs are? The ones that are often buried in your subconscious? It's sometimes hard to distinguish between what you really believe, what you believe you believe, and what you feel you should believe. If you feel, for instance, that if it weren't for bad luck, you'd have no luck at all. You won't find yourself winning big in any lotteries. And gold prospecting is definitely a poor career choice. On the other hand, if you believe you are basically a lucky person, you'll find yourself walking into a job interview the same day that the person in the position you're best qualified for announced his retirement and generally stumbling over good opportunities at every turn. Which brings up the fundamental question, is there really such a thing as luck to begin with? Certainly there is, and it's entirely under your control. The point is, every condition in your life is a manifestation of something you believe, a thought made into reality, but you have free will, the freedom to change that reality for the better. No matter how ingrained your subconscious beliefs may be, they can be changed with meditation and the understanding that the truth is always positive, always good. It is up to you to let that truth make you free. If you enter a brightly lit room filled with objects of every color and put on a pair of red tinted glasses, green objects will appear brown or almost black. Reds will lighten or disappear entirely. Something printed in a light red will be indistinguishable from the surface it's printed on. Try the same thing with green tinted glasses. Other interesting changes will occur. Amazing how the way you look at things can alter your reality, isn't it? All you have to do is change those mental lenses to bring about the reality you want. And the best lens is one that's absolutely clear. It will give you an unfiltered view of the truth because the truth is that everything you want is already yours. Why doesn't everyone know and practice this principle? Why is there so much misery, poverty, and illness in the world? Logical questions, but this and other principles are not as obvious as they may seem, and the ability to believe utterly to the point where it is not simply belief, but knowing, is not born into us. We must be trained and even those who have studied metaphysics for years can find it difficult to overcome beliefs that have been pounded into them from infancy. It's like gymnastics. Almost anyone can become a relatively accomplished gymnast if he or she starts while the body is still flexible and follows a regular workout schedule. But how many do so? Very few. Because most don't believe it's possible for them. Because they're busy with other pursuits because it is just important enough to warrant the effort, even though they know it would bring them health, pleasure, feelings of accomplishment, it's just too difficult, and most give up after that first fall. It's a good thing babies don't feel that way about walking. But be assured that a life of happiness, health, and prosperity are within your reach. If you make the effort, few of us will ever become a master, such as Hermes Trismegistus or Saint Germain, but virtually everyone can make his or her life on this earth and beyond a joyful experience 
We simply have to want it as much as God wants it for us. The principle of correspondence. The principle of correspondence can be simply stated as it is above, so it is below. As it is below, so it is above. This means that everything in our earthly environment, every object, person, event, or emotion has its analog or correspondent in all the other planes of existence. We are given much conflicting information in the course of most religious education. We are to believe in a loving God, and yet this is the same God who condemns us all with a blanket indictment that says, man who is born of woman is conceived in sin and tells us that we must atone for that sin throughout our lives. It isn't even our sin, but that of Eve, putting aside the concept that Adam remains apparently blameless, and that the whole story is more symbolic than historical. Common sense tells us that a loving God would hardly hold an entire species to blame for its putative progenitor's error. And why would God want to deny us the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? If he wants us to avoid evil, in our lives. If one is to avoid something, one had better be able to recognize it. A loving parent doesn't tell a child, watch out for the deadly gazilch, without at least giving the child a verbal description that will allow him to tell the difference between a gazilch and an ice bucket. And if God is omniscient, then he must know before the birth of a baby whether or not he or she is doomed to a life of misery or will be condemned to eternal hellfire. This isn't loving. It's downright cruel, and common sense tells us God does not act in this manner. And what is the analog of common sense on the spiritual plane? It is divine wisdom, the wisdom of which we are a part and which is within all of us, the wisdom that by its very existence tells us that God wants us to know good from evil, that he wants us to know everything we are capable of learning, including how to control our own lives and destinies. As it is above, so it is below. Another way of saying that we are all analogs of God, though we can no more imagine what it is like to be God than an ant can imagine what it is like to be human. But we can visualize the correspondences since we are blessed with greater consciousness than the ant. An ant cannot recognize that man and ant alike build homes and cities and protect them from enemies have territories and unfortunately go to war over their boundaries and that we both have strict societal structures we can see these parallels and apply them to the planes above us as well as those below many people walking along the street will change stride to avoid stepping on a grasshopper almost everyone will swerve his car to avoid hitting a small animal and anyone in full possession of his senses would swerve slam on the brakes and risk hitting a tree rather than hit a child in the road. These are actions taken without thought, actions born of reverence for life, for we are created in the image and likeness of God as it is above, so it is below. If we are the creations of an indifferent, uncaring, or cruel God, the animal or child would be no more than an irritating obstacle to us, and our only consideration would be the amount of damage hitting them might cause our car. Recognizing, understanding, and making use of these correspondences between the planes is a matter of relative levels of consciousness. There may be animals of a genius level capable of seeing parallels between themselves and man. There are certainly people on earth today whose spiritual consciousness is so evolved that are capable of perception on levels other than the material one we occupy. And within this vast universe, there are doubtless many races of beings, both above and below us on the spiritual scale, even some who have evolved beyond the limitations of physical existence. If any interstellar travelers have visited us, they would most likely be of this type. The speed of thought is instantaneous, but physical beings are limited to less than the speed of light. The Principle of Vibration the third hermetic principle states that all things have motion, which is another way of saying that all matter has energy. Einstein took it a step further by showing that matter is energy and vice versa. The vibrations of a rock exist primarily on the atomic level, 
and its potential energy is a function of its mass in relation to gravity. The impact of a falling rock is quite measurable. Thoughts, too, have their characteristic vibrations and colors, corresponding to the frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. When we speak of vibrational colors, we are speaking in analogies as a way of visualizing the invisible. Positive thoughts have extremely high vibrational frequency, and their colors are brilliant and luminous. Negative thoughts vibrate more slowly, and their colors are dimmer, more opaque. The same is true of the vibrational frequencies of the positive and negative spiritual poles. A positive thought, like a mind that is positively polarized, cannot be overwhelmed by a negative one. But when the majority of ideas a person carries within are negative in nature, that person's polarity can become negatively aligned. But there must be a negative core for those negative thoughts to gain a foothold. If you can maintain that positive polarity, there is nothing for negative thoughts to adhere to. Jesus said, The God of this world comes to me and finds nothing to seize hold in me. He spoke of Satan, the negative polarity that governs the majority of earthly minds. Material things from the atomic level on up have circular motion. Electrons appear at random in their orbital shells. Planets orbit their suns and galaxies revolve around their galactic centers. The linear force of gravity produces this circular motion through a combination of distance, velocity, and relative mass. The spiritual analog of gravity is, of course, the attraction we call love. There is motion that crosses the barriers between the physical and the spiritual, and this is vibration. Most of us have seen sound waves made visible on the screen of an oscilloscope with the lowest notes, those with the slowest frequency, having high and wide peaks and valleys, and the highest notes appearing almost as a straight line. We use the same analogies to depict the frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves and microwaves, through the narrow band of visible light to X-rays and gamma rays. Spiritual vibrations act in similar ways to those of light. Our emotions are vibrations with the lower frequencies the most negative and the highest frequencies the most positive or godlike. Like light waves, these emotional vibrations can augment each other, such as anger stimulating the same emotion in another human being or love responding to love, or they can cancel each other out by being out of phase with each other. The vibrations of good cheer can quickly dispel ill will between people. Prayers, treatments, thoughts of God can do much to cancel out the negative vibrations of illness and unhappiness. And we have all seen how a bitter argument can spoil a pleasant occasion for a room full of people, keeping your own thoughts in a pleasant mode by recognizing the good, the beauty of a situation can go a long way toward maintaining the good mood of others through positive reinforcement. The Principle of Polarity This is an expression of the duality of all things. The fact that everything has its positive and negative side, its contradictory elements. And there is a seeming contradiction in the principle as well. Though the two poles seem to be diametric extremes, they are in fact the same. And what separates them is a matter of degree. The reason for this is that when we are speaking of poles, we are speaking in terms of something that has no beginning or end, the circle. Take the chromatic spectrum. We say that red and blue are at opposite ends of the spectrum, yet blue shades again into red. Through hues of violet and purple, there are no ends to the spectrum, only an endless circle. East and west are only relative terms if we travel to the east for some 24,000 miles, we arrive at our starting point. What we call hot and cold are only measurements of the same thing, temperature from the absolute zero of space to the millions of degrees at the core of a star. We are really measuring various degrees of heat. The same characteristics are true of the mental and spiritual planes. Are love and hate truly opposites? We say these emotions are two sides of the same coin, but the operative word here is same, for love and hate are easily confused and both are measurements of degree of affection or emotional attraction if you prefer. Fear and valor follow the same rule. Without fear, there can be no bravery because bravery is not fearlessness. 
but the overcoming of fear, and both extremes are levels of bravery, from paralysis to the burst of action that characterizes a dragon slayer. What is just as important is the fact that opposites can be changed. Love can become hate, misery can be transmuted into happiness, poverty into wealth, sickness into health, and vice versa. And this is true because matter and spirit or energy are also poles, having no more than vibrational degrees of evolution between them. Spirit is the more positive of the two, just as truth is more positive than a lie. Love is more positive than hate. Knowledge is more positive than ignorance, and motion is more positive than inactivity. We can change our polarities by meditating briefly on the condition we want changed within ourselves and then strongly on its opposite. We can turn fear into courage by considering the fact that if fear is in us, then so is courage. That courage is the higher, more positive trait, and that God's will is for courage for the most positive aspects in all of us to become dominant. You will soon see the change in yourself once you have put your wishes into words, and you will also see that you can make these polar changes in others, in the conditions that surround you as well, using the principles of mentalism and vibration. The most general approach in changing others is to recognize, greet, and awaken the higher self, the Christ, within that exists in your fellow man. This can be done by simply remembering and stating that this higher self, this truth, is the perfection of God, also known as the Immaculate Concept. You'll be able to forget the defects in others and concentrate on their positive qualities. Soon those defects will lessen and those positive aspects will strengthen, not only in your own point of view, but in fact. The positive vibrational frequency of the accomplished metaphysician very often has a profound effect on any environment he enters. His presence alone is sufficient. The confident good will in his eyes, his caring smile and appearance of serenity and happiness serve to polarize all negative mental states around him. With a few positive words, he can change the humor of those around him, transforming despair into hope, anger and frustration into smiles and determination. The vibrational power of Jesus was so great that he would heal with a touch, reaching out and discovering the immaculate concept in others polarizing the perfection of God in them to turn illness into robust health. And when he said, go and sin no more, he was referring to the error of negative thoughts, words or deeds that had brought illness upon them. Metaphysicians know that all illness is mental or spiritual in origin, unwittingly created by the individual. We also know that illness can be cured through mental and spiritual treatment. Please note that we do not advocate avoiding doctors or ignoring their advice. They are as much a part of God's plan for your good health as is your spiritual well-being. Remember, people who have never heard of metaphysics get well under their care. While the mechanics of establishing good health in yourself are deceptively simple, developing the faith, that absolute sense of knowing that perfect health is literally your God-given right, that will accomplish this takes time, study, and practice. Relying on the knowledge and skills of your physician is not an admission of your metaphysical ineptness. It's common sense. The under or overlying truth is that there is no death. There is only life. Illness, then, is a function of your belief. We have all been taught, to some degree, that we begin dying the day we are born. The process of aging seems to bear this out. It is difficult to put aside the facts we have been taught since early childhood, but it must be done. Let us begin by saying that we begin to evolve from the day we are born, by believing that when we shuffle off this mortal coil, we do not die. We are moving on to another level of personal evolution. Life is indestructible. Death is misconception, and illness is a byproduct of this misconception curable by divine wisdom, spiritual healing, polarization, and its earthly correspondent common sense, medical care, and good health practices. You must first learn to love yourself before you can truly have capacity to love others. The same is true with polarization. You must start with your own persona. Let's take the simplest possible example. 
The smile is the outward manifestation of well-being and belongs to the positive pole. The wrinkled brow belongs to the negative pole. When you feel negative vibrations, sadness, anger, frustration within yourself, smile. Affirm the good that is within this seemingly negative situation and add, I want the good to show itself. In arranging your face into a smile, you have begun the process. Your body recognizes this muscular configuration as something connected with happiness, and the rest of your body begins to attune itself to the same positive frequency. You will soon find your spirits lifting, your thoughts considering solutions rather than dwelling on the problems, and your smile will have become more than a muscular exercise. It will be real, because it now comes from the inside. Just like anything else you wish to master, polarization takes practice. Once you become adept at this, you'll discover that you can create a sense of well-being in others as well. Smiles can be positively contagious. The Principle of Rhythm In the section on vibration, we discuss the inward and unseen oscillations that characterize people, moods, emotions, events, and life in general. When we speak of rhythm, we are talking about the more visible macroscopic cycles shown by all things and beings. The seasons of the year, the ebb and flow of the tides, the pole-to-pole -pole swing of a pendulum, the repetition of contraction and relaxation of the muscle that sends the lifeblood through our bodies, the predictable cycle of sunspots and solar flares in our sun, and the multi-billion year cycle of an expanding and contracting universe, life death, rebirth, the fluctuations between the poles, we are subject to all of these tidal rhythms and we must learn to use them rather than being overwhelmed by them, just as an Aikido master learns to turn his opponent's every motion to his own advantage. We do this through polarization, using the rhythms in our own lives as a zephyr uses the enormous power of a cresting wave, always staying just ahead of its collapse. Once you have acquired a significant measure of spiritual control over yourself, you can develop a rhythm of your own, learning to move with the positive flow and avoid the negative ebb. This is possible because there are two levels of mental processes. The wave is on the lower plane and so we can make use of that positive crest to reach positive polarity and then elevate our thoughts to the higher mental plane, remaining at that positive pole while the wave collapses, leaving that negative undertow with nothing to hold on to. To use another analogy, it's something like riding a roller coaster to its highest point and stepping off into a convenient platform before it begins its downward plunge. Specific treatments for elevating yourself to the higher mental plane and for positive polarization will be found in all of my books. Once you understand the principles, however, You'll be able to create your own treatments of prayers in your own words. Remember, words are powerful, but it is your faith that gives them that power. The Principles of Cause and Effect The mind is a dynamo, a source of energy, and thoughts are the energy it generates. Thought energy is expressed in vibrations or waves like radar or sonar, returned to us, bringing information about the future our thoughts have created. We have already seen how we reap what we sow. The more current terminology is what goes around comes around. We know that our beliefs as to what will happen, what we are capable of, what other people are like actually determine those events, create our capabilities and affect the attitudes and actions of others. Thoughts are a powerful form of energy indeed. They do not merely reflect, they create. So if you feel ill will towards someone, if you act unfairly or do something that brings physical or emotional harm to another person, your thoughts, words, or acts create vibrations of a negative color or frequency, and those vibrations attract vibrations of the same hue, bringing negative events into your life, and these rebounding negative frequencies are doubled in intensity when they return to you. An unkind remark can bring you a minor auto accident. A lie that causes someone to lose a promotion can lose you your job. Adherence to truth and goodwill 
are principles that should be adopted simply because they are positive and right, but they are also for your own good. You reap what you sow. This is part of the system of perfect balance around which the universe is built. You may ask, what happens if someone dies before you can redress a wrong done to him? What about an obviously evil person who has built a fortune on the stolen works and wrecked lives of others? Who lives with a beautiful family and a kingly luxury? Or the person who has spent his life helping others, who has visited with tragedy and disaster, the death of loved ones and catastrophic illness? The answer to these and similar questions lie in karma and reincarnation. Universal justice and balance go beyond a single lifetime. Few people are godly enough to achieve a perfect life on their first try, and God is merciful enough to give you all the chances you need to even things out. Karma is the balance of positive and negative vibrations you have created at the end of a physical lifetime. The good person who suffers misfortune is someone who is balancing the bad karma of a previous life with his good acts. His misfortunes are the negative vibrations that have followed him to this life. Very likely such a person is ready to evolve toward a higher state of being. The bad person who seems to have nothing but good fortune is reaping the rewards of goodness in a previous life, but he is destroying that positive karma with his bad acts in this life. He will suffer for it in this life or the next. As for a debt you may owe to one who has left this life, if the debt is a small misdeed, you may erase it by general good works in this life. If the debt is enormous, one that has resulted in great unhappiness, both your future lives will be intertwined. Such vibrations are said to be in phase, and the two of you will be contemporaries in another life, where you will be in a position to set things right. Indeed, you will be subconsciously driven to do so in that life. This vibrational attraction is just as strong for mutual emotions. Those deeply in love and those with powerful animosities will find themselves drawn together in subsequent lives as well. Reincarnation may seem a radical concept to some, and this is because of our Western reliance on material evidence. Though there is a growing body of just such evidence that has convinced many Western minds that reincarnation is fact, considering the fact that we live today, that we have a soul, we consider to be immortal is the idea that the soul, that essence which inhabits several bodies any more outlandish than that it inhabits one. I find it no more unlikely than living in several houses during the course of one earthly life. And there are literally billions of people of various races and religions throughout the world who accept reincarnation as logical and unquestionable truth. And that includes quite a few million in the materialistic Western world who are as thoughtful about their spiritual lives as they are about physical existence. We have and always will have complete control over the events of our lives. With this knowledge comes the corollary awareness that we are responsible for the bad in our lives as well as the good. What we must avoid at all costs is a sense of blame and self-destructive feeling of despair that can go along with it. For those feelings act as a decree. Your thoughts of blame and self-punishment will become fact and misfortune will be drawn to you. It is self-forgiveness which you must practice. One of the values of the Catholic ritual of confession is the absolution it brings. It is not the priest, of course, who forgives the confessor's sins, nor is it God who has already forgiven. It is the sinner himself. That self-forgiveness opens the door to undoing your past negative thoughts and deeds with new and positive practices. It is the doorway to goodwill and perfect harmony. The Principle of Generation the underlying theme of this principle is that there is a masculine and a feminine side to the beginnings of everything. What is true among the higher evolved creatures of this physical plane, plants, animals, people is symbolically true of the higher planes as above, so below. So you can see both polarity and correspondence are involved in this principle. The laws are inseparably interwoven to form the seamless fabric of the universe. When we speak of masculine and feminine, we are not speaking of sexuality, but of the polar components that produce life. Again, we speak symbolically. Science is seen as a masculine component, religion as feminine, intelligence is viewed as fatherly, and love as motherly in their roles. And when we speak of religion, we are not speaking of the church. Religion is a body of beliefs founded on faith and love. 
The word church means a convocation of men, and the idea has degenerated into a bureaucracy of laws, ritual, sins and punishments, all of which bear little resemblance to the teaching of such masters as Jesus or Moses. Religion is personal, individual faith. Church is politics, and those who embrace the dogma of a church most fervently are most often those in whom faith is the weakest, for they have not discovered faith for themselves, but have had it handed to them, neatly categorized, laden with canonical additives, and packaged like a frozen dinner. It is difficult to live by one's religion on such a strict and restricted diet, and those who manage to do so are godly indeed. Science proceeds under considerably less restraint, although there is a tradition-bound hierarchical structure in scientific circles. As a result, man's progress in discovering the laws governing this physical universe has been considerably more rapid than religions or the church's understanding of the spiritual realm. The goal of metaphysics is to reunite science and religion. After all, both grew from early man's curiosity, his desire to understand the phenomena that surrounded him, as such things as lightning, volcanoes, the motions of the planets became explainable in physical terms, these phenomena left the realm of mysteries of the gods and entered the province of man's science. But science still has its mysteries, and personal religion has its practical side. The great teacher Emmett Fox calls the practical application of religion scientific prayer. And the books in this series are designed to show you how the laws of the universe are both scientific and religious, and to teach you how to make a practical use of these laws. And with the joining of the masculine and feminine components of life and the universe, we can generate true understanding of that universe and approach the perfection that is its grand design. And that concludes The Seven Universal Principles by Connie Mendez. I just love her writing style, and it's so consistent with everything else we've talked about. She makes some fascinating assertions that are fun to think about. We have the seven principles, which are the principle of mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and generation. And this very much reminds me of the Kabbalion, which goes into these hermetic principles very much in the same way. We had an episode where he dedicated on the secret of rhythm, rhythm being important in understanding our daily habitual rituals and our weekly and yearly rituals and the way that those things affect us. But each of these together, as she describes in the beginning, that each of these principles are working together in one coordinated fashion. So we're not dedicating our time to just mentalism or correspondence or vibration. This is altogether the way the universe works at a very basic level, particularly when it comes to manifesting when it comes to creating realities. If we can understand that everything is mind and there is a correspondence, as it is above, so it is below. Everything in our earthly environment, every object has its analog or correspondence on other planes of existence. So we can understand that all is in mind and in this other plane of existence is a correspondent to all the things that we see about us and they move with vibration, that all things are moving with different frequencies and vibrations, and that positive vibrations have this unique effect, that all is dualistic, as we see with the principle of polarity, and that we understand that there is light and dark, good and bad, hot and cold. And in this particular simulation that we're in, duality seems to be the key concept, and that we can understand this principle of polarity and move ourselves to the higher polarity, understanding that it's all the same thing. And when we advance our understanding of this polarity, we begin to recognize the larger level of rhythms around us. It's all cause and effect, that all thought energy is causing everything around us. And when we consider that Everything that we see around us is thought. And we go to the final principle that there's a masculine and feminine side, that there is this dualistic level of creation as a part of these polarities. When taken all together, we understand the very forces 
that we can use in manifesting our realities. These rules always can be utilized to our advantage. It gives us a leg up. When we consider the rhythms and the vibrations and the correspondences, then it gives us a greater level of knowledge and sophistication in our abilities to imagine our realities. All things are possible in this world. I am so excited to tell you that every episode that there is unlimited possibilities available to you. I have seen incredible miracles all with the mind and your thoughts and your mind are creating this universe that you see around you. But if you can understand the underlying principles behind it, you can begin to manipulate it and it becomes your play toy in which you can use it for service and helping others and living a joyous and blissful life. These seven universal principles will help lead you to that place. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Please put a like on this video, put a comment on this video. It helps out with the algorithm. I'd love it if you checked out my art. You can find it at www.newearth.art. I'm sending all my love to everyone and I'm vibrating with you at the highest level and welcome to the reality revolution. Mm-hmm.